Amen. All right, so if you haven't been with us for the past several weeks, we've been in this series called Finding Purpose, where we've been taking some time and talking about this big idea that all of us have things in life that we feel like we need to do, that we need to accomplish. And maybe you're here today, and there are some things that you, you think, you believe that God is calling you to do. And so the question that we're asking as we've gone through this series is just, like, what does that look like? How do you do that? What are the next steps that we need to take to live a life of purpose, the life that God is calling you to live? And so today, as we continue this series, I want to talk about something that I think for a lot of us, this is really, really easy for us to overlook. This is one of those things that really we don't even see as a big deal. It's easy for us to justify not doing this. It's easy for us to just totally glance over this until we mess up, until we make a mistake and the bottom falls out. And we realize that if we don't have this one thing in our life, it has the potential to ruin absolutely everything. And so today, I want to take some time and talk about integrity and the importance of being a person who isn't just one way around certain people and other way around other. That if you want to live a life of purpose, you have to live a life of integrity. Now, before we get into it too much, when I talk about integrity, what I'm talking about is a person of conviction. A per person of principle, right? A per person, I'm going to really struggle with this. A person who has a set of guidelines and standards that they are convicted of and they will not compromise. They will not waver no matter what the circumstances. Or the way that we talk about it with our youth. That a person of integrity is a person who is the same no matter who else is in the room. Which sounds kind of easy, right? Like, just be the same. Just be you. How many of you have ever heard that one before? Just, just be you, right? As if it was just that easy. But let's be really honest here. How many of us have we had those times and those moments in our life when we change who we are based on who else is in the room? You ever been there? For example, you ever been having a conversation with somebody and maybe a hot topic issue comes up, and as you're talking with this person, you realize that you believe something very, very different than what they believe. I know, this never happens to anybody, but just bear with me, right? And as you're talking, you're like, wow, we really disagree. But here's the deal. You don't want to fight. You don't want to start an issue. You don't want to start a scene. Because a lot of us, we don't want to cause any trouble. And so rather than being a person of integrity, rather than just telling the other person what you believe, you just kind of agree with them because you don't want to start any problems. You ever do that one before? Because it's just easier to not cause problems. It's easier to just agree and get out of the conversation and then go about my normal life. That it's easier to abdicate integrity. Or how many of us have those friends and I, I'm convinced at some point we've all had these friends, right? You, you ever have those friends that every time you're around them, they always seem to get you in trouble? Do you know what I mean? Like every time you're around them, it's like you're always doing something that you shouldn't be doing. They're always getting you in trouble. And the thing is, it's like when you're in those moments, it's like you don't even want to do it. As you're going through it, you're thinking to yourself, this isn't me. Every ounce of your body and your soul is saying, don't do it. But you just can't help yourself. There's just something about being around those people. You just can't help it. You just want to join in. They always seem to bring out the worst in you. See, this is the thing about being a person of integrity. Is that... When we don't have integrity in our life, we run the risk of losing absolutely everything. And what's really, really crazy about this is when we talk about integrity, if you were to talk about it in just about any other situation, it's really obvious that integrity is important, isn't it? Like, we do this all the time. For example, if you're on an airplane, right, and the pilot gets over the intercom, and says something like, this is your captain speaking. We wanted to let you know 
the integrity of the plane has been compromised. How many of us would be worried? I don't know about you. I would be pretty worried. I don't even like flying. And I don't even, like, the reason I don't like flying, it's not necessarily because you're up in the air. That does bother me a little bit because, I mean, you're up in the air, like, a lot. I just don't like being crammed together with all those people in the little tube. That bugs me. But I don't know a lot about flying. But the one thing that I know is that the integrity of the plane is pretty important, right? Because without the t integrity of the plane, we run the risk of losing everything. Without the integrity of the plane, we run the risk of crashing and burning. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but the same thing is true for us in our lives. And in fact, let's just be really, really painfully honest. How many of us have heard stories in the news Maybe you've seen it on Twitter. I think that counts. It's debatable. But how many of us have heard stories of pastors or church leaders who've compromised their integrity? Maybe it was a moral failing. Maybe it was a mismanagement of funds. I think that's the proper way of saying it. Maybe it was just an abuse of power where they used their power and authority over people to hurt and manipulate and abuse. But how many of us have heard stories of pastors or leaders who've compromised their integrity and because they did, they caused a whole lot of hurt and a whole lot of pain in the lives of the people around them. And in fact, maybe you're here today and maybe that's your story. Maybe you're here today, and you were hurt. You have a rough relationship with church. And the reason you do is because at some point, a pastor or a church leader hurt you. They did something they weren't supposed to do. And if you're here today, and that's happened to you, I just want to say I'm sorry. On behalf of church leaders and pastors everywhere. Unfortunately, this is something that we see from time to time. See, this is what happens when we compromise our integrity. The damage, the damage can be really, really substantial. We run the risk of losing absolutely everything. Now, they might be successful. And we need to understand this. Because there's a difference between integrity or between purpose and success. See, I think a lot of times we confuse them, don't we? We confuse purpose and success. We look at success and say, well, it's the same thing as purpose. But we need to understand that success is a little bit different. Because the definition of success that we come up with usually comes from the world around us, right? We look at places like Walmart and Target, uh, Tesla and Amazon and all of these big companies. And we say, okay, this is what success looks like, right? That success is more. And we want to apply that to the church. And so we say things like, well, the way that we know that we're in our purpose is by having more. That if we have more people, then we're fulfilling our purpose. That if we have more money, then obviously God's doing a big thing because otherwise we wouldn't have money. If we have a big building, then obviously God's doing something because it's more, right? And more, in our mind, is the picture of success. And we need to remember that's not always the case. That there's a difference between success and purpose. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm not saying those things are wrong. But when the goal, when the goal becomes more for the sake of more, when it becomes about more people for the sake of more people, we have a problem. Because the purpose of the church is not more for the sake of more. The purpose of the church is to help people. To help people take their next steps in following Jesus, no matter where they're at in the journey. Whether that's their first time at church, their first experience with Jesus, whether that's the next step of baptism, whether it's like learning the basic disciplines of faith, whether it's being connected to a community and learning to share the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs of life and faith with other people. We are called to be a community, the church, capital C Church, not just Redeemer. We are called to help people. Take their next steps in following Jesus, no matter where they're at in that journey. 
Now, here's the thing. Sometimes that happens, and you, you see more. You see a lot more. Sometimes you see a little more. More isn't necessarily bad, as long as we're focused on the right thing. And the tragedy is, is when we see these leaders who are focused on the wrong things, they may even have more. But that doesn't mean they're living a life of purpose. That when you compromise your integrity, you miss out on the thing that God has in store for you in your life. Which for me at least, raises the big question. How do we live a life of integrity? How do we develop integrity? Because integrity is like a muscle, right? By the way, that's true with a lot of things when it comes to faith. I've talked about this before. Remember, faith is like a muscle. The way that you grow it is you use it. You put yourself in situations that are outside of your comfort zone, right? You take that leap of faith because just like in the gym, the way you get stronger is by lifting more. Same thing is true with integrity. Same thing is true with patience, which is why we say in church, you never pray for patience. Because God's going to put you in situations that pushes your patience. Again, same thing's true with integrity. And so what does it look like? How do we begin to grow it? And so if you've got your Bible, do me a favor. Turn with me to John chapter 15, because check this out. Jesus talks about this. Again, we're going to be in John chapter 15. I just want to look at a couple of verses here. John chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 1. Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, I want to stop here really quick. One of the things we've been talking about off and on over the last couple of weeks is this idea that whenever Jesus teaches, a lot of times, he's using things around them as an example so that people like see this visual understanding of what they're talking about, right? Now, this story takes place after the Passover meal. In their culture, rabbis like this would often, after the Passover, go to the temple and spend some time praying, right? By the way, if, you, if you're familiar with the story of Jesus, you know that after he has that Passover meal, he and his disciples, they go out and they start praying. Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for future believers, Right? And so this story probably takes place at the temple. And the reason this is so significant is because on the temple, there was this giant golden grapevine that they called the true vine. Jesus is looking at this giant golden grapevine with his disciples and saying, look at this. He says, I am the vine and my father is the gardener. Now, if Jesus used visual examples, I thought it'd be cool if I did the same thing. And so, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, I like to garden. Um, in fact, just this week, we put out a lot of, of plants, uh, including a lot of tomato plants. And so, I thought it'd be cool if I helped us, as we go through this verse, this is one of my tomato plants from home. Uh, I pulled this guy aside, partially because I wanted to use him as an example for you, uh, partially because he was a little bit sad looking, and I wanted to kind of help nurse him back to health before I got him in the ground. And so here's our tomato plant. We'll call him Bob, because Bob the tomato. And so as, well, I didn't have any cucumbers, bud. No, Larry. But as we go through this, I wanted to use this guy as an example to help us understand the teaching of Jesus. And so John 15, verse 2, says this. Jesus says, talking about Father, he says he cuts off, Every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So a couple of things here. He begins by saying, every, uh, he cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. If you've got your Bible, I want you to notice the phrase, cuts off. And if you're really, really bold, I want you to scratch out the phrase, cuts off. Because I'm going to be honest, and I know it sounds blasphemous, bear with me. That is a horrible translation. You see, the Greek word here for cuts off is the Greek word arrow. A-I-R-O, arrow. What's interesting about this word is that every other use of this word in the New Testament does not mean cut off. This is the only time it's used like that in the New Testament. Every other time, you know what this word means? Yes, to lift up. 
Now, to help us understand this, notice, notice my plant here. Now, I don't know if you can see this. I've got a, a little pole here holding this guy up, and I've got a twisty tie making sure this, this little plant stays upright, right? What happens if I pull the pole out and I take the twist tie off? What's going to happen to that plant? It's going to fall over, right? Now, let me ask you something. If you were trying to grow a garden and your plant was laying in the dirt and in the mud, do you think it's going to be likely that tree, that, uh, that, that, that plant, gives you any fruit? No, right? Why not? Because it's in the mud. It's in the dirt. Listen. In life, we all go through difficult seasons of life. And sometimes in life, we find ourselves in the mud. We find ourselves in the dirt. When we find ourselves in those seasons, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to get through the next day, let alone be fruitful. And the good news of this story is this is a God who doesn't leave you in the dirt. He doesn't leave you in the mud. He lifts you up. He goes on to say this. He says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, I don't know how well you can see this because this is a little fella. But I want you to notice here we have the vine, yes? The, the main trunk. If I have a hard time calling it a trunk. But we have the main trunk here, right? Like the vine. And then we have the branch over here. And I don't know if you can see this. Even online, if we like super zoomed in, I don't know that we would be able to see it because it's pretty tiny. But here in between, in the elbow between the vine and the branch, I'm really bragging about myself doing that. I better not. But we have this little sprout that's coming out, okay? Now, in tomato world, we call those a sucker. And the reason we call it a sucker is because if you leave this thing alone and you let this little sprout continue to grow and you don't do anything about it, what's going to happen is it's going to turn into a full branch. Now, I'm going to let you know, as a tomato person, if you're starting to grow tomatoes, you don't want that. Because what happens is the, 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 the plant gets focused on producing all of these branches, and the problem is, is that plant will put all of its effort, all of its energy into making all of these other branches. And do you know what it's not doing? Making fruit. If you have a good, healthy looking tomato plant with all of these branches, it's green, it's beautiful, but it doesn't give you a single tomato. Is it helpful? Is it doing anything at all other than growing and looking green? It's not easy, by the way. Sorry. There you go, Dean. There's your reference. It's not easy being green. He's always looking for a movie reference on me. This is the best I got today. It's not helpful. So what you have to do is you have to prune it. And by pruning it, it forces the plant to focus on other things. It focuses on giving it energy and the fruit so that it can become more fruitful. Listen, if you want to live a life of purpose, if you want to live a life of integrity... That means you have to say no to things. Sometimes the things that we say no to are just bad, right? They're not good for us. They're bad. They cause hurt in our life. There are things that we need to cut out because they're harmful. And this is the part that none of us want to hear. Sometimes we need to learn to cut out good things. Because the branch is good, right? Like, if, if the plant had no branches, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Sometimes we have to learn to cut out good things because they pull us away from our purpose, because they're keeping us from the things that God is calling us to do. The problem is we live in a world of distraction, don't we? We live in a world where, okay, let me just say this, how many of us feel the pull every day to do like a bazillion different things? Every single day, we are tired, we are exhausted because we're so busy doing everything. But what if we're do so busy doing everything, we're doing nothing well? What if we're so busy doing everything that we're actually missing the one thing that God is calling us to do? That if you want to live a life of integrity, if 
you want to live a life of purpose, you've got to learn to focus on the things that God is calling us to do. And that means you need to cut out some good things. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you never take breaks, you never take vacation, you never take time for yourself. But when those things start to bleed over into the vast majority of our life, then maybe we've got some problems. What are the things that God is calling us to do? And are we laser focused on those things? Jesus goes on, verse 3. He says this. He says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And then he says this, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So, Jesus says, remain in me. Listen, you want to know how to have integrity in your life? Integrity begins with integration. The way that we keep and maintain and build our integrity is by being connected and integrated with God. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so I thought I'd use poor Bob here as an example. I'm going to do it. It's going to happen. And I'm sorry. But here we got some branches, and I'm trying to decide which ones I want to take off here, because I'll be honest, I, I, I kind of want to take a lot off. So I got this branch here. I'm just going to start from the bottom, because the OCD in me is going to go crazy. All right, here is a branch, right? This branch is no longer, it's kind of sad looking, that's why I had no problem taking it off, but this branch is no longer connected to the vine. Yes? Okay, good. Making sure we're all paying attention. Let me ask you the obvious question. Can this branch produce any fruit whatsoever by itself? Why not? It's not attached, right? Same thing is true with us. The way that we live a life of purpose is by being integrated with God. And for so many of us, one of the greatest tragedies is we want to live a life of purpose but we spend our entire life missing the opportunities that we have to connect to God. We miss the opportunities around us. Things like reading our Bible on a daily basis. It sounds so easy, but let, let's be honest. How many times do we skip over that every morning because we just don't have time? There's too many other things to do. Things like praying. Praying on a regular basis. Again, it sounds easy. It's so simple. It's just like a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there. You can even set out more time. It's the great thing about it. It can go for as long or as short as you want. But how many of us have that intentional time where we're doing that? Or how often do we say things like, yeah, I'll get to it. And then we never really get to it. And what happens is when we refuse to read our scriptures, the word of God, when we refuse to pray, when we refuse to connect to the vine, we live our life like this. Even things like connecting to others, community, coming to church on a regular basis, being connected to a small group. I, you see, when we talk about integration, when we talk about being connected to God, I think our first thought is always the other things, isn't it? Well, the way that I connect to God is through prayer. The way I connect to God is through Bible study. But we miss, we miss the importance of community. Let me explain it like this. We have a tomato plant here. If this thing, and this is pretty little, if he or she, continue, we're, we're calling him Bob, so it's a he, continues to grow, eventually it's going to have these branches with flower clusters on them. Those flower clusters will eventually turn into fruit. See, when I think about the importance of community and church, I think about those flower clusters. When we connect to others, that's our opportunity. That's the opportunity that we have to produce fruit in our life. Because when we hear the struggles of others, when we hear about other people going through hard times, that's our opportunity to say, hey, how can I pray for you? Hey, what, what can I do to help? Hey, here's some money. I know you're going through a hard time and you're struggling to make bills made make the you know what i'm saying let me help you out 
here's an opportunity to serve. See, community is like the branch with flowers. It's the potential of fruit. But the question is, is what are we doing with the potential? Are we becoming potent? Or are we dying with potential? A tomato plant with a bunch of flowers is kind of useless. I mean, it looks pretty, don't get me wrong. But I don't want flowers. I want fruit. Are we living a life of purpose by connecting to others and going from having potential to being potent by serving, by loving, by praying for the community of people around us? This is why being connected to a community is so important. It's the cluster of flowers that has the potential to become so much more. But again, that happens when we're connected to the vine. If we're disconnected, if we're never around other people, are we going to have the potential to serve the people we're never around? Being connected to others is just as important as reading your Bible on a daily basis and praying on a daily basis. That it's when we connect to others that we have the opportunity to serve the community around us. So let me just ask you, what's that next step for you? What is that next step of integration for you? Maybe for you, it is like taking the time and saying, you know what, I'm going to carve this time out every single day, no matter what. This is my number one priority. I'm going to read the Bible every single day, even if it's just like three to five minutes. Three to five minutes is better than no minutes, amen? Maybe for you, it's setting up that regular time to pray where you're opening up, where, where you're just going before God and having a conversation. Maybe for you, that next step is being part of a community. Whether, whether that's just committing to be part of a church community, saying, you know what, I'm going to go to church on a regular basis. I'm not going to miss unless I absolutely have to. Maybe it's being part of a small group, going a little bit deeper. Because again, when we connect to others, we have those opportunities to serve. And that, that is when we begin to produce fruit. One more thing. We have vine, we have branches. We have a branch here. I'm going to take this one off. I want you to look at this branch. Is this branch living or dead? It's dead, yes? Okay. Just making sure. It still looks good though, right? That's why I picked this one. It looks a little bit better than that one. That would have been a horrible example. This still looks like a good branch. It's still leafy. It's still green. It's still pretty. You know, as I think about this branch, I'm reminded of something that Paul said. Romans 6, 23, you guys know this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. See, this is what it looks like when we sin. Whenever we sin, it disconnects us from God. It separates us. Whenever we sin, it looks like death. I think it's easy to kind of dismiss our sins, doesn't it? How many of us justify our sins? We sin, we're like, yeah, it wasn't that big a deal. It's a big deal. And a lot of times when we talk about that in church, well, I think we focus on how, you know, it was serious because Jesus was willing to die for it. But I think we forget the seriousness of what it does to us. It separates us from God. And the wages of sin is death. But don't miss the rest of that. The good news is that Jesus came and Jesus died to reintegrate us to God. To graft us back in. To reconnect us. And so maybe you're here today. And maybe you're new to the whole church experience thing. And maybe you want to have a conversation about Jesus. Because maybe you're here today and you feel like this branch. You're just struggling. You feel like you're dying inside. It's just the weight and the pressure of everything is so overwhelming. And you're tired of it. You're tired of feeling like a plant that's been cut up. Maybe you're here today, 
And you want to have a conversation about what it looks like to follow Jesus because the good news of Jesus is that Jesus doesn't leave you like this. He doesn't leave you on the ground. He lifts you up. He reconnects us to the vine so that you can be reintegrated with God so that you can continue to step into the life that God is calling you to live, a life of purpose. And so here in a sec, the band's going to come up. We're going to play. If you want to have a conversation about Jesus, I'm going to be over there. I'd love to talk with you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for Jesus and just the incredible way that he taught using the things that were just all around him. God, I pray today that you would open our eyes and show us, show us the ways that you're calling us to get connected with you, whether that's through prayer or Bible study or fellowship. God, just open our eyes and open our hearts and give us the courage to say yes to that. Give us the courage to follow you, to intentionally connect, because if we don't intentionally connect to you, we're going to pass it up every single time. God, thank you for not just the gift of connection, but the gift of reconnection. That through Jesus, you gave us a chance, an opportunity to reconnect to you. God, thank you for Jesus, that he was willing to give up everything so we could be set free, so that we could come back to life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.